Growing up in Montana, I spent most of my time outdoors. My dad worked as a guide for hunters, and I followed in his footsteps. I've always felt comfortable in the wilderness, and I've explored many remote and wild areas of the U.S. then. I got a job as a guide in Canada's Northwest Territory. To reach some of these places, you have to fly in a small plane called a bush plane. Hunters pay a lot of money to go on guided trips there. It's some of the best hunting and fishing in the world, but the land up there holds its secrets, and the few who know about it want to keep it hidden. I can't tell you exactly where my story takes place, but it's a place you probably won't ever go to anyway. The valley is off limits for hunting now, and hikers rarely go there unless they can afford to hire a pilot. There aren't many local pilots willing to fly there anymore. Pilots can be superstitious, so they say the place is cursed, and nobody questions it. That's the story you'll hear if you ask around. The land is cursed, and it's best to stay away. But that's not the real story. Throughout my years working up in the remote wilderness, I've heard plenty of stories about curses, but to me, they were just that, stories, like tales you'd tell around a campfire. Many of them date back to the gold rush era. Someone found gold up there and probably made up the stories to keep others away. At least that's what I believed. Once I was leading a group on an elk hunt. We had just been dropped off by the pilot and were set to spend five days out there. I wasn't too worried because we had electric bear fences for our camp. Still, being in such a remote wilderness area with dangerous wildlife around, there's always a level of danger but I made sure we took all the proper precautions. We chose a spot to set up our camp close to a decent-sized river. It provided us with fresh water, and we noticed elk tracks along the river's edge. But we knew it wasn't just elk that liked to hang out near water sources like this. That's why we set up the bear fence around our camp to keep any unwanted visitors away. That night, I heard something moving around outside our camp. I couldn't quite see what it was in the darkness, but it seemed to be kept at bay by the fence and never tried to get inside. Just to be safe, I kept my gun close in case it was a bear. The ground was soft from the rain the day before, so I decided to check for tracks in the morning to see who our visitor was. If it turned out to be a bear, we'd have to relocate our camp. As morning arrived, I was puzzled by what I found. There were tracks around our camp, but they were unlike anything I had expected. They were human tracks, and what's more, they were barefoot. I considered the possibility of someone sleepwalking, but when I asked the group, no one admitted to it. Plus, none of us had dirty feet, and these footprints were in the mud outside the fence. It didn't make sense for a sleepwalker to open the gate without getting shocked. Besides, the noise from the fence would surely wake anyone up. I discovered more footprints by the river, and it was clear that someone else was out there with us, but who could it be? And why were they barefoot? For a moment, I couldn't help but wonder if Bigfoot might actually exist. But these tracks were the size of normal human feet. Perhaps someone was living off the grid out here alone. That seemed like the most likely explanation, but it didn't ease my worries. Some of the hunting party wanted to leave immediately, but our pilot wasn't due to pick us up for another four days, and we had no way to contact him. After the strange barefoot person left our camp on the first night, they didn't bother us again. We carried on with our hunting trip without any more surprises, but it wasn't until one of the hunters shot an elk that I started to understand what was really happening in the valley and why the locals warned people to stay away. The elk was hit in the gut, so we had to track it through some tough terrain. The hunters were getting tired, but I was determined not to leave the wounded animal behind. We decided on a meeting point by the river, and I set off alone to track the elk further. I followed the elk's trail through the forest and into a clearing on the other side. There I found the elk lying dead on the ground, but it wasn't alone. Three people were standing over it. It's hard to describe them exactly. They were definitely human, not like Bigfoot or anything like that. They were just regular people. When I crested the hill and saw them, all three of them turned to look at me. One of them held a stone knife, but they didn't move to attack me. It seemed like they were preparing to cut up the dead elk. These three individuals were shorter than most people, and their skin was tanned and weather-beaten. I wouldn't call them cavemen, but they did have a primitive look about them. 
Their clothes were basic, made from what appeared to be leather. Perhaps they belonged to an uncontacted, isolated tribe. I'm not sure. What struck me was how skinny they were. They seemed in need of the elk more than we did. I slowly backed away from them, then turned and made my way back through the forest. I chose not to tell anyone about what I had seen for many years. When asked, I simply said I had lost track of the elk. It dawned on me then that the locals were aware of these people. They knew they lived in the wilderness and tried to let them be. All those stories about the place were meant to keep people away, but not for the reasons I had initially thought. Like many others who used to lead expeditions in that area, I stopped organizing guided hunts long before the region was declared off-limits. Occasionally hikers still venture into the valley, but they are rare. Strangely, the people who inhabit the wilderness there seem to actively avoid encountering them. Greetings, I have a story to share with you. It might seem a little strange, but bear with me. This tale revolves around an unusual encounter I experienced. My name is David, and I come from a town in southern Louisiana called Lakeville. It's located far to the west of New Orleans, close enough to Texas that you could reach it in less than an hour by car. For quite some time, I've been a dedicated viewer of your program. I enjoy relaxing and listening to the fascinating stories people have about mysterious creatures and other intriguing phenomena. It's been a passion of mine since I was a child. So when I heard that you were seeking personal accounts, I thought it was about time I shared mine. This unusual event took place at a small lake just outside a town called Lakeville. I was enjoying a fishing trip there, and the sun was setting rapidly, painting the sky with beautiful hues. Now, I can't say for sure if the timing had anything to do with what I witnessed, but let me tell you all about it. As my friend and I were wrapping up our fishing adventure, he hopped into his truck and drove off in a different direction towards his home. Soon after he left, something peculiar caught my eye. There's a little island nearby covered in tall grass and I noticed movement over there. It wasn't just a trick of the fading light. Something was definitely stirring on that island. It looked like a person, but all hunched over as if they were searching for something they dropped. Then, in an instant, they straightened up. The way it moved was strange, almost like a robot. So there I stood, squinting at this figure about a hundred yards away, and suddenly it spun around to face me. It was incredibly fast. What really caught my attention was how it turned without moving its feet. I almost didn't mention that part, but I swear it spun without taking a step, if that makes any sense. Now this thing was standing tall, easily six feet or more. Its skin had a murky green color like pond scum, and it felt rough and bumpy, similar to alligator hide. The eyes were large and round, a deep yellow with slits for black pupils. They seemed to glow in the light, giving them an eerie appearance. Its head was long, resembling that of a dinosaur, with bony ridges running down its back. The arms were unusually long, extending beyond its body, ending in clawed hands that seemed incredibly strong. Its torso was bulky and muscular, like that of a bodybuilder, but it was the way it moved that was truly unsettling. Its movements were too precise, too deliberate, not like anything I'd seen before, almost like a mix of different creatures, like a strange hybrid. And then there were its wings. They were not covered in feathers like a bird's, but rather they resembled bat wings, made of leathery skin with visible veins. When it spread them out, they were twice as wide as its height, easily. Watching it unfold its wings was like witnessing a curtain being drawn back, revealing something you wish you hadn't seen. There wasn't a sound, at least not one I could hear over the pounding of my own heart. But the way it approached me was swift, not like a person running, but more of a sudden leap using its wings to balance itself, perhaps to appear larger and scarier. Oh, I almost forgot to mention its legs. They were thick and ended in what seemed like three-toed feet, each toe equipped with sharp talons, resembling those of a bird of prey. But this creature seemed like it came straight out of a prehistoric time. When it leaped, that's when I realized this wasn't something familiar. No human moves like that. It seemed like it defied gravity, jumping into the air with its wings wide open, gliding away in an unusual manner. 
It wasn't exactly graceful, but it got the job done. I didn't hesitate. I sprinted to my car, started the engine, and stepped on the gas pedal as hard as I could. That creature, it soared into the air, its wings stretched out like a massive bird. But there was something strange about its flight. It didn't move smoothly, especially after that bizarre twisting maneuver. I didn't dare glance back until I reached the safety of the paved road, which was about a mile away. My mind was in turmoil, tangled with thoughts. Later my friend called, and there was an odd tone in his voice. I thought he was just checking in to say he made it home safely, but it turned out he had seen something peculiar in his rearview mirror too. At first he thought it was an owl crossing the road right after he left me, but the size didn't match that of an owl, so he just kept driving. Once he got home, he couldn't shake the feeling that he needed to make sure I was all right. I asked if he noticed anything else, but he said no. He only caught a quick glimpse of it. So I shared with him everything that happened and what I saw. Needless to say, we don't fish in that area anymore, no matter how good we think the fish might be biting. We have other friends who still go there and boast about it, but we steer clear. Anyway, this whole ordeal happened years ago. I've been keeping an eye on your channel since last year, hoping to find something similar, but so far no luck. Nonetheless, I'm relieved to have finally shared my story. Thanks for listening. If you ever find yourself near Lakeville, especially as the daylight fades, keep your eyes peeled. You never know what you might encounter, and if you do see something, please let me know. On the night when everything happened, I strolled along my usual path, a routine I followed daily after supper. Whenever I felt overwhelmed, I liked to meander through downtown, letting the fresh air calm my mind. That evening was no exception. Work had been chaotic, leaving me in need of a breather. I found myself at the outskirts of town, where houses were scattered and the streetlights flickered inconsistently. Amongst these houses stood one that had remained vacant for as long as I could recall. Its windows were boarded up, its garden a tangle of wild growth. The neighborhood kids often whispered that it was haunted, but children tend to label any eerie-looking place with spooky tales. Until that night I hadn't paid much attention to it, but for some reason it beckoned to me. The gate swung off its hinges, emitting a creaky sound that seemed straight out of a classic spooky tale as I gently pushed it open. It made me chuckle to myself, imagining how I'd narrate this adventure as if I were the protagonist in a ghost story. Trudging along the overgrown path, my sneakers crushed gravel and crinkled dead leaves underfoot. The house towered above me, its outlines blending with the darkness of the night sky. As I approached, I noticed the front door slightly ajar, which struck me as odd. Even for an abandoned house, you'd think the door would be shut or at least locked securely. With a hesitant push, the door swung inward, emitting a groan akin to an elderly person easing into their favorite armchair. Inside, the scene was exactly as one might expect. Furniture draped in layers of dust, wallpaper peeling away like aged skin, and that unmistakable scent, a combination of mold and decay. I roamed through the rooms on the ground floor, encountering nothing but remnants of a bygone era. It felt somber, imagining the laughter and joy that once filled these now desolate spaces. Then, a sound echoed from below, a distinct noise, as if something heavy was being dragged across the floorboards. Initially, I brushed it off, thinking it might be animals seeking shelter, perhaps raccoons or the like, but the sound seemed too deliberate for mere creatures. Curiosity gripped me tightly. It's a funny thing, curiosity. Sometimes it leads you down unexpected paths. Against my better judgment, I found myself drawn to the source of the sound. With trembling hands, I pulled open the door to the basement, illuminating the darkness below with the beam of my flashlight. As I descended, the air grew cooler, and each step I took seemed to protest, as if warning me to turn back. Finally, I reached the bottom, and the beam of my flashlight pierced through the darkness like a sharp knife. Dust particles swirled in the light, creating a momentary stillness. Then I spotted them, eyes gleaming in the flashlight's glow, reflecting it back like miniature mirrors. They belonged to... Well, I can't quite find the right words to describe it. 
It certainly wasn't human, that much was clear. It crouched in the shadows, its skin absorbing the darkness around it. When it moved, it seemed to meld seamlessly into the blackness, moving with a grace that made my skin crawl. This entity, for lack of a better term, resembled a patch of night detached from the floor. It didn't just reside in the shadows, it seemed to embody them. Its limbs were numerous and elongated, contorting in ways that defied logic, akin to branches swaying in a fierce wind. Its head was twisted in an unnatural shape, its eyes shining with an unsettling awareness. Yet despite its eerie presence, it moved in absolute silence, almost as if it were composed of whispers in the wind. The air around it seemed to thicken, pulsating with a strange energy that made the entire basement feel alive. Then, in a soft hiss, like the sound of shadows dancing, it vanished into the darkness. It melted away into the shadows, leaving behind an empty space as if it had never existed. Suddenly my legs found their strength again. I sprinted as if my life depended on it, racing up the stairs, out of the house, down the overgrown path, and didn't stop until I reached the safety of the streetlights, gasping for breath. All the way home I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see those piercing eyes trailing me from the darkness. But there was nothing, just the stillness of the night and the echo of my hurried footsteps. I haven't dared to revisit that place, haven't even walked on that side of town since that eerie encounter. Maybe it was just my mind playing tricks on me, you know? Perhaps it was a mere illusion caused by the play of light or a shadow cast by some old piece of furniture. But deep down, I can't shake the belief that what I witnessed was real, that there's something lurking in that house, something beyond the realm of normalcy. And you know what's even stranger? I can't confide in anyone about it. Who would believe such a tale? They'd likely brush it off as stress or suggest that I was imagining things. But you know me, I'm not one to fabricate stories. So here's the scoop. That's the reason behind my recent nervousness. But let's keep this between us, okay? I'd rather not become the subject of gossip with people whispering that I've lost my marbles, seeing monsters in the shadows. But deep down, I know what I saw. And I'm just not prepared to confront the implications of that revelation. Not yet. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Tim who lived in a quiet little town nestled between two hills in West Virginia. It was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone else, and the most exciting thing that ever happened was the yearly town fair. But here's the twist. The fair wasn't even hosted within the town. You had to drive to get there, and that tells you a lot about the place Tim lived in. Now, Tim had this amazing dog named Buddy, a scruffy little mutt with a heart as big as his bark. Buddy was Tim's partner in adventure, his loyal companion, and they did everything together. One summer night as the sun was setting low in the sky, Tim and Buddy decided to take a walk in the woods behind Tim's house. The trees were casting long shadows, making Tim a bit nervous. When you're young, even scary things can feel like an adventure, right? There's something exciting about danger when you haven't learned how serious it can be. You have to find out those limits on your own. So, Tim and Buddy ventured deeper into the woods, surrounded by the familiar sounds of chirping crickets and croaking frogs. The air was thick with the earthy scent of pine, and Tim could feel his heart racing with excitement. Buddy, always full of energy, was trotting ahead, his tail wagging happily. They followed a winding path that led them to a clearing. The sun had gone down, but the sky was still that dark blue before it gets totally black. You know, the kind of sky that's blue and empty. Suddenly, the atmosphere changed, and a cool breeze made Tim shiver. He couldn't shake the feeling that they weren't alone. Buddy seemed to sense it, too, his ears perking up and his nose twitching as he scanned the darkness. That's when they heard it, a strange growl echoing through the trees. Buddy's fur bristled, and he took a defensive stance, his tail up and his eyes fixed on the shadows. Tim strained his ears, trying to locate the source of the sound. It was then that he saw it, a pair of glowing amber eyes peering at them from the darkness. Tim's heart raced as the creature emerged. It looked like a wolf with wings. Not quite a bat and not quite a canine. 
its wingspan stretched wide, casting a frightening shadow on the ground. Its fur-covered body hid the strange arrangement of its limbs, bat wings, a wolf's torso, and limbs that seemed almost human. The air grew colder and an eerie silence settled over the clearing. Buddy, usually brave, whimpered and pressed himself against Tim's leg. Tim could feel the fear in his loyal friend. The giant bat locked eyes with them, and a screeching howl filled the air. It was a primal sound that froze Tim in place. He knew they were in trouble. With a sudden burst of speed, the bat lunged at them, but somehow Tim was faster. He grabbed Buddy's collar and sprinted away, the thundering beats of the creature's wings echoing behind them. The woods became a maze of shadows, and Tim could feel the creature closing in. His legs burned with exertion, but the adrenaline pushed him forward. He wasn't going to let their adventure end in tragedy, not for him, and certainly not for Buddy. Buddy barked frantically as they zigzagged through the trees, the bat's menacing howls still echoing in the air. The moonlight flickered through the leaves, creating a dizzying play of light and shadow. It felt like a nightmare, and Tim half expected to wake up any moment. As they neared the edge of the woods, Tim saw the old shed where they stored his father's tools. Desperation fueled his actions, and he pulled Buddy inside, slamming the door shut behind them. The world outside fell silent. The only sound was their heavy breathing. Through the cracks in the wooden walls, Tim could see the giant bat circling the shed. Its eyes glowed in the darkness, and Tim held his breath, praying it wouldn't find a way in. Buddy whimpered beside him, his tail tucked between his legs. Tim reached down and stroked his fur, trying to reassure him, though his own fear was bubbling just beneath the surface. The minutes stretched into an eternity, and the bat's growls seemed to fade into the background. After what felt like hours, Tim cautiously opened the door and peeked outside. He swung a shovel around a few times for good measure, letting the creature know he meant business. The clearing was empty, though, the giant bat nowhere in sight. Tim and Buddy emerged from their hiding place, both on edge, but the beast had vanished into the night. They made their way back home, the moon still hanging high in the sky. The rest of the world was unaware of the terrifying encounter Tim and Buddy had just survived. Tim tucked Buddy into his bed, his body still trembling from the ordeal. As Tim lay in his own bed, staring at the ceiling, he couldn't shake the feeling that those glowing eyes were still watching, waiting. They had faced something otherworldly that night, a creature that defied explanation. And though the giant bat had disappeared into the shadows, its haunting presence lingered in the depths of the woods. They never went that way again. But Tim could tell you for certain that he thought about it all the time. Once upon a time, when I left the army and moved to a new place called Kentucky, I decided to get a dog. I really liked chows, so I thought it was a perfect chance to get one. Finding a good chow breeder was tough, but I found one all the way up in South Dakota. She was a beautiful red chow that I named Foxy. I got her at a good price because she couldn't have puppies, but she was already a year and a half old when I brought her home with me. Foxy wasn't used to the Kentucky woods. She had lived in the flatlands of the prairie her whole life, so whenever we went for walks in the wooded trails, she was excited to explore. Every night when we got home, I spent time picking burrs and twigs out of her thick fur before bringing her inside. One day while we were on our walk, the sky started to turn a strange dark gray color, and I noticed flashes of light behind the clouds. It looked like a weird storm was coming, so I called Foxy, and we went back to my truck to head home. Strangely, just a short distance down the road, the sky was clear. I thought about going back, but I didn't want to confuse Foxy, so we went home. I took out my grooming tools and started cleaning Foxy on the porch. That's when I saw the sky overhead looking just like it did on the trail. I thought it was just a strange storm, so I called Foxy over to clean her up before it started raining. Chows are naturally nervous dogs, so I didn't think much of it when Foxy seemed anxious about the weather. But then I got scared, too. Something dark came down from the clouds, hovering just above the mist. It was big, round, and had flashing lights on its ends. 
Foxy ran to the edge of the yard and started barking up at the sky, trying to protect me. Suddenly, a beam of light came down from the object, and Foxy was right in the middle of it, her fur standing on end from the static in the beam. Then there was a flashing light, and when I opened my eyes, the sky was clear and Foxy was gone. I went to my neighbor's house for help, but they hadn't seen or heard anything unusual. They said I had been gone for four hours, but it felt like only a minute had passed. When I went back home, Foxy was there on the porch, but her fur was still standing on end, and it took almost a week for it to go back to normal. I don't have any good answers for what happened that day, but I hope it never happens again.